And I literally felt that I was on fire. I felt my body was on fire. And then all of a sudden I recognized that this fire that I felt was internal. It was an internal fire. And it was like it was flowing all the way through my veins, like a lava of some kind. It was horrific. It was moving constantly. It was moving constantly. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't breathe. I thought I was suffocating. And it just sucks everything out of you, this 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 fire within. It it caused me to chomp down and grit down and gnash, gnash my teeth. I was gnashing and grinding my teeth because of the agony of it all. The whole time this is moving constantly in my body. Well, from that point on, I was gone. Immediately, it was like something catapulted me down. And hell is down. I went down. It was like I was in some kind of a cylinder and it was the blackest, blackest, blackest darkness that you can't not imagine. Welcome to Touching the Afterlife. Our guest today is Pat, and she is here to share with us a personal testimony about going to hell and what was revealed to her. You're not going to want to miss this today. So welcome, Pat. Thank you, Julie. As you know, because it's been uh, since 2008, since I actually shared this with just a few people, Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that when a person, myself, at least myself, uh, I have, when you relate back to it, you you go back through it. And mm-hmm. it, um, it made such an impact and a mark on my life. It changed my, my life forever. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I just want to, I, I want to thank you because I believe the Lord led me to you. It wasn't on my radar at all, but I, I can see the wisdom of God not having me release this until now. And so mm-hmm. thank you so much for responding to my email because that was, I put it out there and said, Lord, you know, if this is what you want to do, then, then let her respond. And you did. So thank you so much. It's well, a blessing. Definitely- thank you. And yes, we definitely felt like you needed to come on and share. So we would love for you to start, take us through this, where you feel comfortable, where you want to start. I was brought up in, in a military home. My father was uh, retired as a high-ranking officer in the Air Force, so I was raised in Europe. I was exposed to different cultures. When I was uh, out of school, I worked, and I, uh, over in uh, Turkey, I I lived right near Ephesus, and I worked over there for a year, and uh, so I experienced a third world world, uh, war country. And um, so I've been exposed to many cultures and many things in my life. And I had a very good childhood. I was very blessed. Uh, The old military way uh, was quite different from it is now. I had a a very healthy relationship with my father. So therefore, when I became a born again Christian, I had a very healthy relationship with my heavenly father. And so uh, saying all of that, my parents took us to church back in the day it was called sunday school and uh, we went to sunday school and both my parents uh, were believers and uh, even though they were of different denominations but they were both believers and so i was exposed to that and i learned the bible and i learned all kinds of things and i i always believed in god i always believed in jesus i knew nothing about the person of the holy spirit I went to concerts back then, I, you know, uh, enjoyed my social life. Um, but I was never into, uh, like some people were, I was never into uh, drugs. Um, I didn't drink a lot because I can't stand alcohol. I can't stand the smell of it or the taste of it. And that was good because uh, that's one of the uh, generational curses in my family that's passes down from generation to generation, but it didn't touch me. Um, I did uh, develop a habit of smoking when I was 13 years old, but I was delivered of that when I became born again. And so um, I, I, I came all the way up until I met my husband. This was during the Vietnam War, and he was in the military as well. And I met him then, and he was running away from God. I was running to God. I 
I just never, I knew this hole was in my life. And I, I was always seeking, even when I was 16 years old, I want to let you know this, I did go forward in a, in a crusade. Uh, back then, Billy Graham, when he was still alive, I went forward. But it was an emotional appeal. And I went forward in this crusade and I said, yes, I need to make, I need my life to change. And it was a conversion, not a regeneration, which is there's a difference. And so I, emo I, I responded to the emotional appeal. I asked Jesus to become the Lord of my life, but nothing changed. I didn't have anybody discipling me which is what we're supposed to be doing. I had no one to come alongside me and to help me in that. I was a teenager. And so I just went back to my carnal ways and uh, because I had no power in my life, you know, and I just went back and did what I was doing in those times. So after my husband and I got married, he was running away from God. I was running to God and because he was born and he was raised up in a very strict religion. And so he didn't want to have anything to do with that. So I always say we collided. God brought us together and he did supernaturally. We were both in sin, but God supernaturally brought us together, even in our sin, because he knew our potential and he knew uh, how, our walk and where we were going to go in our walk with him eventually. Um, eventually, after we became uh, married, uh, and, um, and, and all, you know, the children, you know, were coming, all the children were coming and, um, we, uh, I became born again first, uh, things weren't going well. And I just became born again. I was at a, I worked at a place where a woman was a, a spirit filled Christian. I didn't know anything about spirit filled Christians. I didn't know anything about the baptism of the Holy spirit. And so she started, we had smoke we would smoke on our breaks together because back in those days you could smoke everybody smoked you could smoke in the buildings and everything so on our breaks we would sit and smoke and she started talking to me about the lord and she was an older woman so anyway long story short she led me um to invited me to her uh church and they were a they were a denominational church but um they believed in the baptism of the holy spirit and so i was so hungry I mean, I was so hungry inside for more in my life, and I always have been. I've always been a hungry person. When I was a youngster, I was hungry for knowledge, and I was always reading and learning. I was a, I was a voracious reader, and I was the one that stayed up all night under the covers with a flashlight. So I was always, that hunger was always in me. So when she started talking to me about these things, I immediately thought, I want, I want to know about that. What happened was I started going to that church with her. And then I, I invited my husband to go to that church with her. We were exposed to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I recognized that I needed that in my life because I didn't have the power that I needed to resist the carnality of life, the things that were still in my life. And I needed more power in my life. And they told me that that was, you know, that was the power of how uh, the Holy Spirit brings into your life to for service and to overcome. And that's what I needed. As we progress forward, eventually my husband after me became born again. And um, he um, I, I was not I, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which was. Uh, very important. And uh, it took a while because the Lord had to get past my head trying to figure out how does this work because I'm very analytical. And so I always, tr I'm always trying to figure things out instead of just receiving it by faith. But um, then my husband became born again. And so we decided um, when we became born again that we, we were very in, much in the world. And so now we're going to just, you know, we had this desire to be take that total commitment that we had in the world and turn it into our commitment to our Lord and King. I was so grateful to be forgiven of all the junk in my life and all the things that I had come through in my life and, and all the stuff. And uh, because, you, you know, we know our sins. We know where we've been. We know what we've done. And uh, I was just so grateful that he forgave me for everything. And he took the shame and the guilt and the burden of it all. And I, I, it was like I couldn't do it enough 
for this uh, man that gave his life for me. And what can I what can I do, you know, to uh, serve you with all my heart? So from that point on, I was radical. I was radical for the Lord. And so we started devouring the word of God. And back in those days, um, you know, you had you had cassette tapes and we had some books and things like that. But we were we we go we were led to, you know, uh, like a church or whatever. When we were growing up in the Lord, we were led to church churches where they were uh, uh, believed in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so that we were around people of like precious faith and that kept building us up. But over and over the years, we just read what we could, but we focus mostly on the Bible because uh, I believe that it is the word of God and it is it, God says what he means and he means what he says. And so we took it literally everything. And we we chose to believe that everything that's spoken in the word of God, uh, that we're going to believe it. And uh, if we don't understand it, then we're going to have to learn why we don't understand it. And we ask the Holy Spirit to help us. So the years passed. And as we were growing up in the Lord, we were we began serving in the body of Christ. And so we helped pioneer. And I'm I'm just making this really quick. We, we helped pioneer three churches. Uh, we've done everything you can imagine when it comes to serving in that capacity, serving the body of Christ. Uh, we felt this was our reasonable service to do this, and we were growing and maturing and um, becoming seasoned, and we were studying the Word, which is very, very important because it renews your mind. And if you're not studying the Word, if you're not spending that time before the Lord, your mind is not going to be renewed. And uh, so, therefore, you're going to have some uh, major problems in your Excuse me. I'm going to take a drink, Julie. If you're not studying the word of God and spending that time before him being refreshed every day and um, seeking him, uh, then you're going to go backward, backwards. So we um, um, we eventually became we started becoming, you know, leaders. We were having Bible studies in our home. Uh, we even evolved to um, uh, hosting people from other countries. We were exposed to some of the generals that are now in heaven that people talk about now. Uh, we were exposed to their teachings when they were still on earth in person. And uh, we would go to any place we could to try and glean more about the Lord from people that actually knew the Lord and that had lived their life committed to the Lord and not just people that were listening to other people and talking about it, but they weren't living it. We wanted to surround ourselves, which the Bible tells you to do, to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you, who are more mature than you are in the Lord so that you can learn from them. And so we did this. And so eventually over the years, um, we were asked to be in leadership we were asked to be elders. We and and because my husband uh, has the gift of healing on his life, he would go into hospitals and pray for people. And so eventually, we decided to become. Uh, we were ordained in our training and everything, but it was only for uh, that to open up doors where maybe you couldn't get in elsewise. We were not called as pastors, even though we pastored people or shepherd people, or I like to use the word disciple. Um, we were not called as fivefold pastors. And so um, we just we just cared about God's people. We cared about the sheep. So at the time that I was taken to hell, uh, I was, we were in a, in a, a, a new, a church that was very fast growing and uh, we were leaders in this church and uh, we also were in business and our kids were growing up and we were very, very involved, very, very, very involved in works. And that's important to the, to the reason I was taken to hell is because we had got sucked in to just it became works. It became religious works. And uh, we were doing anything and everything serving the body of Christ, but we were neglecting. Uh, we started neglecting other things. And we were focused on that way too much. 
and not we did not keep our focus where we stayed hungry and thirsty. It was more about being busy. And uh, I, I, uh, uh, I think Oswald Chambers said this one time that good is the enemy of best. And yeah, we were doing good things, but we were off and uh, we didn't know it. And so at this, at this place where we were serving as uh, leaders at the time, we uh, uh, all of a sudden we started seeing air coming into the church. We were, it was a large church, well, large and not as large as some of these mega churches, but it had, it had several hundred people in it. And um, it was a new church and it was growing fast and uh, people started being attracted to it, but some of the wrong kind of people were being attracted to it. And the leadership uh, got off and to where they were opening up doors to different things. And so uh, we were very involved in, in um, Bible studies and having home groups and things like that, cell groups in our home. And so we were very connected to people, whereas the other part of the leadership were very segregated from the people and they were not in touch with the people. So people would come to us and say, you know, hey, what's going on here or whatever. And so the Lord started getting our attention and he started getting my attention. My husband was very busy and not only in self-employment, of which I helped him run the businesses for 28 years, but also involved in church, involved in being a family. So the Lord started getting my attention that um, he wanted us out of there. That was hard because um, what happens is you justify it. That's what happens. You start justifying and say, wait a minute, you led me here and now you're, you're telling me that you want me to leave, but what about all these people? Well, it's not about the people, it's about what God says. Well, it ended up, and I won't tell you how, and I don't wanna go into all the details of what entered the church, but I will just tell you this, that there was mammon was involved, um, there was Jezebel spirit came in, and this all came through the door in the leadership. And so it's because we were staying there in disobedience and we were submitted to leadership because God set up authority. And so we've always been submitted to leadership. And so we were submitted to the leadership. That means that we were uh, also submitting to those spirits that were working, that had come in to that church and we were being affected by them. And they started affecting us. They started affecting our children, but we weren't really aware. And it was all under the guise of a religious spirit that we stayed there. It was a religious spirit that convinced us, oh, you know, you need to stay here. You need to keep praying that God reveal this to them. And all these religious thoughts coming into your mind to justify why you should do what you think you should do instead of just obedience is better than sacrifice. So. Uh, this is this is what led up to uh, when I was taken to hell. And so I want you to realize that when I was taken to hell, I was taken to hell as a born again Christian, baptized in the Holy Spirit, a leader in the church, operating and functioning in the gifts of the spirit. And I was taken to hell. And so the whole thing of mine was how do the righteous end up in hell? Because at that time I was still, you know, believing that because I was a born again Christian, that I still had the righteousness of God on me. And at that time I did, but the point that was to be made to me was yes, but the potential of where you're going in your sin, will lead you to hell if it's not corrected. And so what happened was we were really being challenged. And so my husband and I decided to take two weeks off and go over to Europe and, and it, to a country that we had ministered before and um, stay with some friends. And, uh, and we did in the, in, in the first two weeks of December, of 1999, 1991, excuse me. And um, we were seeking God. How do we do, what do we do? You know, how do we leave all these people? And, um, you know, these people that we feel responsible for because 
we felt if we leave, then they're all going to say, oh, well, something's wrong and we're all leaving instead of seeking the Lord for themselves. And uh, so we were seeking him. And so here's what happened. It was several days before we were supposed to come back to the States. And um, I had not received an answer or, or exactly, you know, you know what to do. And um, so I um, went to bed. We had eaten dinner with some friends and it was very cold and I went to bed and I, it, because it was cold and because they have their heaters on the walls, I was really dressed, you know, warm uh, in my pajamas. And um, unbeknownst to me, and this is important, a uh, demon spirit, a familiar spirit spoke to my husband before he went to sleep. And this demon spirit said to him, um, kiss your wife goodnight because it's the last time you're going to see her, you know? And so he thought, well, that's odd, you know, but he went to sleep. And, um, so I went to sleep and what happened was, um, I went to sleep and I fell asleep and all of a sudden, and I don't know how much time elapsed between the time I went to sleep and this happened, but all of a sudden I woke up with a start and I literally felt, that I was on fire. I felt my body was on fire. And I was fully conscious at that time of my surroundings in the room that I was in. And I jumped out of bed. I jumped out of bed and I said, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what is this? You know, food poisoning, what is this? I didn't feel sick, I was on fire. And then all of a sudden I recognized that this fire that I felt was internal. It was an internal fire. And it was like it was flowing all the way through my veins, like a lava of some kind. And it was an energy. That's, that's the only way I can describe it. And things of the spirit are very hard to explain. And so that's all the, that's all the way that I can explain it. So the lava, it, it was horrific. It was moving constantly. It was moving constantly. Okay. And so... All of a sudden, because it was moving constantly and, it, and, and I, I couldn't breathe, I couldn't breathe. I thought I was suffocating. And um, it was, you know, it was like, you just can't breathe. And I don't know, you know, I, I remember when I was a little girl, I got the breath knocked out of me a lot of times because I was a tomboy and you just can't breathe. And it's, it's this horrible feeling, but yet you do breathe. But then every time you breathe, you feel like it's your last breath, but it's not your last breath, but it's the agony of it. And it just sucks everything out of you, this, this, this fire within. So um, what happened was it, it caused me to chomp down and grit down and gnash, gnash my teeth. I was gnashing and grinding my teeth because of the agony of it all. And then also it, it caused my, I was so dry. I had, I, my mouth was so dry. It was like my tongue was stuck up on the top of my mouth. And the whole time, this is moving constantly in my body. Well, from that point on, I was gone. I immediately was in the spirit. And I know what it's like to be in the spirit because I'm a seer. So I've been taken in the spirit at times. I've been, there's, and I'm, I don't wanna dwell on this, but I have spent time with the Lord personally. I have, I've gone to heaven and seen two levels of it. I've gone in the spirit to different places as a seer, as the Holy Spirit takes me. And so I know what it's like to go into the spirit realm, but I, I had no idea about this. I mean, nothing like this. So immediately I was taken into the spirit and immediately it was like something catapulted me down and hell is down. It, there's scriptures in the Bible that tells you hell is down. And so I went down. It was like I was in some kind of a cylinder and it was the blackest, blackest, blackest darkness that you can't not imagine because everything on this earth has some kind of light. Uh, there's always light around someplace, even in the darkest places, there's still light. But this was the blackest gross, gross darkness that the Bible talks about. And, and, and you can't imagine it. It's nothing on this earth. 
And so suddenly I'm in this terrible and I'm confined. I'm confined in this place. And it was so black. The very blackness of it is suffocating. Uh, people that, you know, they get claustrophobia. This is, I don't, but this is horrible. This, it's the darkness, it's the blackness that's suffocating. So the claustrophobia that it, that it causes on you. And so immediately I knew where I was. I knew it. Because it, here's what happens, and, I, and I'll explain this more labor, later. But in the spirit, everything is intensified. Everything. And so as it is in heaven. You know, the beauty and the wonder of heaven is all intensified. Well, the horrors of hell are all intensified because you still have your soul. So you have all your, your feelings, your, your emotions. You have everything when you're in hell. So everything is intensified. And you know everything in like a nanosecond. You, you know everything. Um, I, I, immediately, I knew I was in hell. For just an instant, just an instant, I said, why am I here? I was totally shocked. Why am I here? You know, the instant, just a second. And then instantly I knew why I was there and instantly I knew I was guilty. My sins, I knew that I was guilty of what the reason I was shown of why I went there. And that's what happens in hell. You know, instantly you're guilty and, and there's no excuse, and you know that. And your sins have found you out, and they have judged you, and now you're there. And so, but I was so shocked because I'm born again. You know, I love the Lord, and I'm living my life for him, and what am I doing here? Well, I know now that I had that, the reason that I thought I had died, I thought I had died. I literally thought I would die. People have been taken to hell when they've been taken to show something about hell or they're visiting hell. And that's fine. You know, those testimonies are fine. But that's not how he wanted the impact on me. He wanted me to believe that I had died and that I had gone to hell. And so the impact of that would mark my life forever. And so I, I, I just, I, the next thing I did I just cried out, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on my soul. Have mercy on me. That's all I could say over and over and over. Have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon my soul. Have mercy upon me. And I knew when I was in that place that there were multitudes of multitudes of people there that they too had thought that they were Christians. They thought they were Christians. They thought they were born again or saved. And they too were there. They had believed the lie and that they were there also. I knew that. And I knew there were people there that were, that were well-known people, and, uh, but they were there. And because they've gotten off in their, in their walk with the Lord. And the reason why he showed me why I was there is the reason that a lot of them were there, and which I will expound upon later. But anyway, so, uh, and, and I, and, but he kept me confined. He kept me confined. And, uh, and as I was crying out for mercy all this time, and, and again, you wish that you can die because every breath is, a, it feels like you're suffocating and your teeth are grinding constantly and this fire going through me constantly where my, I wanted my body to be consumed, but it would not consume my body. It's forever. I knew this was going to be forever. It was never going to end. And I knew that it was forever. And that feeling of being burned up in, a, in fire, I, I've never known that. I mean, I've burnt myself before, but I, I don't know what it's like with some people have experienced where their bodies have been caught on fire or whatever. But imagine that never ending. And that's on the outside. This was coming from the inside out. Even though I know there's the, the, you know, the flames, there are flames and fire and, and hell, but that this one was every time you, for every instant of every moment that you're there, it's over and over and over again, over and over and over again, where 
you want that to be your last breath so it'll end and it's never going to be your last breath it just keeps going on and on and on and on and on well while i was in that state um all of a sudden my eyes were raised and i was able to see outside of the darkness i was seeing in supernaturally and i saw this great chasm and i looked across that chasm and i saw the heavenly city and as i was staring over at the heavenly city i could see i knew I knew that was heaven. I knew that was the heavenly city. I knew that all God's people, you know, that had endured to the end were there. I knew that it was where God dwelt and where Jesus lived. I knew that. And and I I had this, I knew that I was never, ever, ever going to get there. And that nobody over there was going to know that I was here. And nobody could help me. I knew that instantly. And part of my part of my torment in hell because you, you, what happens in hell is it, it's the sins that separate you from God. You see, there had become a chasm between me and God that I didn't know about it through that religious spirit and I'd been deceived. And so that great chasm that he showed me was the separation that I was already starting in when I was alive. And so the impact of that and the, my greatest takeaway the torment is absolutely horrific and never ending. But the greatest takeaway that I have in hell is eternal separation from God and knowing and being able to, the torment is being able to see it and knowing that you will never, never, never go there. And it was your choice. It was your choice. It was my choice where I was. And I knew that instantly. It was my choice because I had used my will to make my choices. And so that to me was the greatest torment of all is the eternal separation of the living and being with the damned forever and the torment of that. So once I looked across there, and also I want to add this, I knew when I knew that there were many people that were like me, uh, that had thought that they, you know, were saved and um, had presumed upon the grace of God that there were others there that were there because of me. And that, to me, that was brought me, I, I felt great remorse for that because I thought my, uh, my influence on another human being or uh, had an effect on them to where it led them possibly eventually in error. And so, uh, I, you know, that to me was very, very terrifying that I was responsible for another person's soul and um, of, or at least getting them to that place of, you know, eternal death instead of eternal life. And so going back to that, that was the, that was the last thing that I saw was the, the great chasm and just staring at it. And while I was staring at it, all this was still going on. I couldn't breathe. The fire was not consuming me. My teeth constantly grinding, grinding, and the agony of all of that within me. And I knew it was irreversible. It was forever. It's forever. Wherever you go, when your body leaves this earth, I mean, when your spirit leaves this earth is for ever and it's irreversible. Once you die, once your spirit leaves your body, there's no more opportunity. It's done. So what happened next uh, after that, um, which uh, and again, I was constantly crying out for mercy, even during that, even when I was looking across that great chasm, I was saying, merciful God. Have mercy upon me, God, merciful God. And so all of a sudden, I'm back in my body. I'm back in my body and I'm in a room and I'm walking in my body. I'm walking. And so I think it's important to tell you what was going on while that was happening to me, what was happening in my body while I was, my body was on the earth. I can't explain this. There are mysteries. I can't explain how 
your spirit can be one place while your body is another walking and moving. I know when you're sleeping and your, your body, you know, your spirit goes to another place or God takes you somewhere or you have a dream or a vision or whatever. I can't explain what I'm about to tell you, but I don't have to because I know it's real. And my husband was my witness. And so that's all I need during this time. And this is important. When I came back during this time, my husband, um, uh, I found myself standing in the room and the day was dawning, which is very important. It was like a new day dawning. I was shocked. My first reaction, my first or response was shocked. I was shocked that I was back alive. I thought I had died and it was irreversible and that was it for me. And so the first response was, I was so shocked at being back. And then the next thing, I mean, almost instantly, the next response was gratitude and thanksgiving that my merciful father saved my life again. He saved me when I was born again. And now he saved me from eternal damnation in what could have been. I was so grateful for that. I mean, that's all I could say is thank you, thank you, thank you. I am so grateful. The third response I had was repentance, godly sorrow. I started just repenting with godly sorrow. And that's what true repentance is, by the way. True repentance is when you are, you are so filled with godly sorrow for your sins that, uh, and you realize you've not only, you've sinned against God, you sinned against yourself and you've usually sinned against other people, but you're, you're so full of remorse. And that's part of the born again uh, salvation. When you are born again, and when you truly receive the gift of salvation, you have this awareness and you are so grateful, but you have to, you have to repent. You have to confess your sin. Confession is, you have to confess your sin. You own your sins. You own your sins when you confess them. You don't just say, oh, I've sinned or forgive me. I made a mistake. No, you own your sins before the Lord. You confess your sin and then you repent. Forgive me, forgive me. And then you put them under the blood of Yeshua, Jesus. And then you uh, ask the Holy Spirit to help you. And that's true repentance. So when you have a truly salvation experience, this should be going on inside of you. And so uh, it's not just say this prayer, raise your hand up or whatever. It's the Holy Spirit working in you. So I, I was repenting. I asked the Lord at that moment, um, share, show me. And this took, this took weeks and months afterwards. But show me every one of these sins that you told me about and why I was there. Show them to me in my life so that I can go back and repent of every single one of them and make it right. Well, while I was, when I came back, my husband was sitting there with me. And so he began, as I was, as I shared with him what happened, he began to tell me what I was doing while I was in hell. And when he saw me jump out of bed and start pacing immediately, what is going on? What is happening? And I was frantic. I was frantic. He immediately jumped out of bed and came over to me and, you know, like, what's going on, Pat? What's going on? And so I, I, I wasn't even aware of him at that time, even though I was still on earth. And so he was just watching me. He didn't know what to do. And I was just pacing. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. And grinding my teeth. And I was having a conversation with with with, uh, you know, in the spirit that he could hear a one-way conversation. He could hear me talking. He could not hear anything going on with me, but he could, from what he heard me talking, he could ascertain what was going on. And that's what he did. The whole time I'm in hell, my body is in a room and I had no energy, he said. I was clammy. I had no energy. I couldn't breathe constantly 
trying my body, trying to breathe, trying to breathe. And he said, you know, the, the, the jaw set and all he could hear uh, most of the time was have mercy upon me. Oh Lord, have mercy upon me. That's what was coming out of my mouth because he was hearing me talk while I was in hell. So that's the majority of what was being said because everything else was spirit to spirit. And so the whole time I was there in hell, I was pacing in that room and that was hours. It was hours that that was going on. I didn't know that. I didn't know that earth time, you know, it was that long. But so all he could do was try to support me. I could not be consoled. And I'd be making these things in my body. Well, that was that energy, that fire, you know, that was going on in me. And so even though that was going on in the spirit, it, my body evidently was doing that back on earth. I did not know that. And I don't know how that works. So, uh, but it was, it was exactly as he told me what was going on with my body. It was correlating with what was going on with me when I was in hell. So he was my witness. And to all of this. And so he, he, you know, once that happened to me, immediately the spirit of the fear of the Lord came upon me, which was another revelation of, um, you know, why uh, so many people fall away and so many people end up in hell and how the righteous end up in hell. And so, um, I, the spirit of the fear of the Lord came on me and I was just marked. I mean, I was so marked and I couldn't even, I could, besides my husband, I could not discuss this with anyone. And I didn't, I never breathed, excuse me. I never breathed this um, to anyone for until 2008. Do I'm going to take a drink. Okay. You know, when I was had been thinking about this, about um, when I was in hell and I was I was like totally isolated. Now, I saw only blackness. I was aware of other people, but I did not see them physically. I just knew because your senses are so uh, personified there. I mean, it's just unbelievable how sensitive you are there. And. I did not see other people, but I was aware of other people. When I reflect back on this for myself personally, I believe it was the mercy of God. A seer is visual. I am very, very visual. And so I have to also protect my eyes, which I have done a lot in my life. I protect my eyes spiritually because the eye is the light of the body. And so I'm very discerning about what I let my eyes see or see a picture, just a picture, a graphic picture can make a real impression on me because my eyes in the spirit, even though I wear trifocals in the natural, in the spirit, I have perfect, I have perfect sight. And so when I see a visual, it's hard for me to get visuals out of my, my mind. And so I, I think that, God, um, he protected me while I was there in his mercy from seeing all the horrors of demons, like a lot of other people have seen, and also the, the terrible fires. And, I'm, and, and, and by the way, those fires are the wrath of God. So when people say that God's presence, presence is not in hell, well, the Bible says that he is in hell, but it's his wrath that you're in hell for, that you see in hell through the fires, because the fire is the wrath of God. So yes, his wrath demonstrated through fire means he's there. So that's what you're, you know, the fires that are there. And I was not, I did not see that. I didn't see all the tortures that some people have seen. And when I ponder this, because back in my day, remember, we didn't have internet. We didn't have any information. There are very few people that ever even talked about if they did go to hell. I think I heard one story uh, until uh, the Internet came on uh, in the, you know, and so uh, people just didn't talk about it. And so I think that uh, as I learned about it more, as I studied, because I've spent the last 30 years, you know, studying it, I have 
my journals and everything. And I'm thinking from hearing other people's testimony that it's at the level of where their sin was at the time. God is very radical. He's a radical God. I mean, if you don't think he's radical, look, look what happened with Pharaoh and the 10 plagues. So he's very radical in his demonstrations or the Red Sea. That was a good one. And, um, but he's so radical that he will use the radical, the extreme uh, to show a person w because of where they are in their life, that is what they need to see for them to be um, so terrified of the possibility that they will stop what they're doing. Okay. Me, for me, it was the, it was the being totally um, separated for eternity because I, you know, up until that point, I mean, even thinking about uh, losing, you know, my salvation or, or losing the Holy Spirit in me, you know, the Holy Spirit leaving me, and I don't even know that he's left me, which happens. These things were terrifying to me. And so the chasm had already started, and he was, that was what he was showing me. Mm -hmm. And so when he shows all these other people these horrific things, I think it's not only for them, but I think it's for those that need that shock and awe. They need to know how horrific it is because it's the very sin that has kept you from the Lord. If you're not, if you don't receive him as your Lord and Savior, the very sin that has kept you from the Lord, you will be tormented forever or sins. Those of you that fall from grace and you can, I'm telling you. I'm telling you, and I say this with authority, it is not once saved, always saved. It is not. That's a lie. And you can, because we have too many examples in the Bible that they fell away from the Lord. Too many examples. And um, so it is not true that once you're saved and once you've got your little name in the book of life, that you are good to go forever, not unless you are pursuing him with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you are being refreshed every single day by the Holy Spirit or staying and obeying his commands every single day. You can be deceived. And so for me, I didn't see all those graphics. And again, it was for my, I believe, as I think about it, I believe it was his mercy for me. He didn't show me all of that. I knew that hell was real. I, I, I've always believed that, you know, in hell and a heaven because I've seen heaven and, and I had never been to hell before, but I believe the word of God, everything the word of God says. So I had, I had, you know, uh, there was nothing in me that was contrary to hell. And I, and, but I didn't realize that it's, you know, those things that have kept you in this life, your lust, you know, all the things that you wanted in this life or kept you from your relationship with the Lord or even drew you away from your relationship with the Lord is going to be your torment forever. And at that time, I was also in a responsible position. If you think about it, I had been my husband and I were leaders in a church. Therefore, there were people that could be influenced by us. And so to think that there was somebody in hell that maybe had been influenced maybe by an opinion or maybe by a false doctrine or something like that, or some, something in my life that had caused them to later on stumble was terrifying to me. The accountability of where you are and what God gives you in this life is, is terrifying in the fact that you're more accountable that, you know, to the greater responsibility you have in this life and the greater things that God has given you in this life or platforms or whatever, you carry more responsibility for that. And so uh, that was why I think he spared me from seeing the horse, but he did not spare me from knowing uh, all of the things in the word of God that talk about what hell is and it's gross blackness and a gnashing of teeth and the fire that's never quenched. And again, I don't believe that fire is just outward fire 
that, that never consumes you. It's also an inward fire because that's what I had and it never stopped. It never stopped. So even the people who have been to hell or seen it or experienced it, yes, they had a unique experience for them, but there's so many similarities at the same time. And what you're describing, the gnashing of the teeth, the fire, those are, like you said, those are all in scripture, but you just didn't see, you didn't, like you said, you didn't see the people, you didn't see different things that other people did, but yet there's still so many, there's this, the same theme, the same biblical scriptures that are talked yeah. about. Mm -hmm. And to me, because I studied the Bible, I love the Bible and I love studying it. And I do, and I've done a lot of teaching. Um, it's very, it was very vital for me to come back and to research and find these scriptures and find all this in the Bible so that I could confirm because God, he is screaming, he is screaming uh, for people to wake up uh, because of the times and seasons we're in and the last days. And I, I, I also understand that there's people out there that when they go to hell, they're not saved. And so they, they're interpreting it through their soul. They're interpreting it through only what they can take from it. You know what I'm saying? And there's imperfection in that because that's the only way they can describe it. But yet uh, that doesn't make it wrong. It just makes it, 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 they're not mature enough to know yet what the word of God says about it. Or they don't even know how to describe it in such a way that the word says about it. And so yeah. they're just telling you certain things. You know? Nonetheless, it's horrific. There's it the is. common theme of what, why we don't want to go there and how we're, we don't need, you know, we, we do need to do everything we can to not go there. I'm, I'm just trying to think from your husband's perspective, you know, he could not bring you back until you, your spirit was ready to come back into your body. But he didn't know. And he didn't know where I was. He no. didn't know where I was. He had no idea. He knew I was in the spirit. Uh, because my husband also is familiar with being in the spirit, but he knew I was in the spirit somewhere, but he didn't know where I was or what was happening or anything. So all he did, he would hold me and, mm. and I could barely stand. So he would have, he said he had his arms around me. I was clammy. I was hot. I was moving all the time away from him. You know, like, you know how, I don't know. I've been around my, even myself when I have suffered pain, I don't want anybody touching me. You know, I'm just in pain. You know, I just, mm -hmm. you grind your teeth, childbirth for crying out loud, these things. So he, he, he couldn't console me. And as a husband, he was trying, you know, he was praying. He was absolutely mm -hmm. praying, but he didn't know anything else. He had nothing to, he didn't mm -hmm. know where I was or what was going on. Only hearing, he could hear the conversation, the one-sided conversation. And, and most of the time, all he could hear was, have mercy on me, God, have mercy on me. My physical body was responding to what was being done in the spirit because my physical body was still alive. I didn't know that. I thought I was dead in hell forever, irreversible. That's what I thought. Why don't you talk a little bit now about why... Were you shown this personally for you? And what message do you want to give us as a result? The, um, there's only one scripture and in the Bible that talks about this. And when I was in that place and I cried out and said, why am I here? How did I get here? Immediately, this phrase came into me, presumptuous sins. Well, I knew immediately what that meant in the spirit. I knew immediately what they were in the spirit. And I was guilty of them because I knew what they were and they were shown to me what they were instantly. It's instant. Everything is instant. You just know instantly. And so I knew I was guilty because I was shown them and I could see. And I think it's, 
you know, I can equate that maybe to when the book of life is opened up to people and everything on everything, every motive, every thought, every intent of the heart has been recorded. And you stand there and you know, yeah, guilty is charged. Guilty is charged. So, so willful sin, is that essentially what you're saying? Yes. And I'm going to tell you, I want to tell you what presumptuous sins are. Okay. So when I, when I came back, and I knew this. And when I came back, I started thinking about this phrase. I have to tell you, it was 1991. I personally and had never, ever, ever heard a message on presumptuous sins. Never. And I'm here to tell you, I have heard many, many messages in my life. I have been uh, heard messages from one of the the people that we admire and respect that have gone on to heaven. Uh, I, I've, I've been exposed to these people. Um, I've learned from these people. And in all of those years, I had never heard one message on presumptuous sins. So I immediately went to the Bible and looked it up. And there's one scripture, Psalm 1913. And Psalm 1913 says, Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. And so uh, it, the, if you look it up in the NIV, which I don't use the NIV anymore, but at that time I did, it says, keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me, rule over me. Then will I be blameless and innocent of great transgression. So what a presumptuous sin is, and this is over time, this is what the Lord started teaching me as I started researching. And again, this was before internet or anything, so you can't go out there and look up. Eventually I did, and I eventually I found a message from Spurgeon, and eventually I found a message from someone else that... Um, uh, in the Harvard Library. Um, but it, a presumptuous sin is one that you commit willfully, deliberately, knowingly, and openly de in defiance, and you are presuming upon God's grace. So the mm -hmm. grace of God is for us who are believers, okay? We are in this time of grace, and we call upon God's grace for forgiveness as we grow in the Lord. But when we start presuming upon his grace by willfully and defiantly saying, I'm going to do this, when we have been warned, we have been warned. And what it is, is every sin that is a presumptuous sin is when you're conscious and, and I can tell you what your conscious is. Your conscious is your, is your uh, compass, your moral compass, and it's in your mind. And so God uses your conscious. When your conscious warns you about something, God uses it and says, don't do this. It's either good or bad. Don't do this or do this, okay? When you ignore, start ignoring that, when he has told you, and there's that time in the beginning where, you know, those places where at first, you know, I've always said when you make a mistake, the first time it's a mistake, the second time it's a choice. And so when you, when God is dealing with you with something in your life and you're all of a sudden you decide you do it anyway. And people say, well, I'm just a work in progress, you know, and I'm just, you know, a sinner saved by grace and I haven't been perfected yet. Well, that's not an excuse. I'm here to tell you that's not an excuse because your heart is not postured toward God and you don't revere him enough to know he's a holy God and you are going to be held accountable for that. And that very thing that you're doing, if you continue doing it over and over and over again, can take you to hell. It can be your very demise eventually. Because what he showed me, and this is important to know, is that the distinction between a presumptuous sin and other sins is not so much the offense, you know, the sin itself, but under the circumstances in which it's committed, okay? So whatever the sin may be at the time the person has committed it, and that person knows 
they've known or they've been convicted about it before and they've been convicted about it again and they've been convicted mm -hmm. about it again because God loves us deeply. He loves us so much that he sent his son, you know, to redeem us from these influences. And so what's, you know, what sin is, is evil influences in our lives. That's what it is. And so sin is our, is the, is what takes you to hell. That's what takes you to hell. And that's what the curse is all about. So when you start justifying your sins or justifying why you do what you do and, and presumptuous sin can be many things for many different people. I mean, I have, I have a whole list of things, just suggestions, but pre presumptuous sin, it is a, it is a willful at that moment. Okay. And I think this is important for people to understand Julie, because I don't think a lot of, it's not being taught as, as much. And when I was growing up in the Lord there, there's still some books out there that you can glean information about the difference between a spirit, the spirit, the soul, and the body. And uh, it's not, like I said, it's not being taught, but there's good books out there that you can read on it now. But we are a spirit being. When, you, when, when we were conceived uh, in the womb, okay, we were given a spirit immediately. And then we are a soul. And the soul is the meeting place between the spirit and the body. And the body is where everything is acted out whether it comes from the spirit or whether it comes from the soul, it's acted out. When we become born again, it's because we were dead in our sins. We were dead in our sins. Our sins make us dead. And, we, and so to bring us back to life, Jesus, Yeshua, when he died, took upon him the curse so that we could be redeemed from that dominion of sin. Okay, that's what it was all about. All right, so when you became born again, then that means that your spirit is born again and you are regenerated. Your soul's not. Right. And many people think that when you become born again, that your soul is born again, and they can't understand why they still have all these problems and all these things going on and all these carnal things that they're doing that they, they just can't understand why they can't get deliverance from them or, or get healed or whatever. It's because you brought all that in, in your soul when you became born again. And now how do you get, and those are all demon influences, by the way, mm -hmm. they're all demon influences. And yes, you can be born again and still have demon influences in your life. You cannot be possessed totally if you are truly born again, but you can have all kinds of demon influences and their habits, you know, it's people having habits. I did. I mean, for crying out loud, I was a smoker and uh, I had that influence in my life. And there's other influences in my life that I had that I, I could not get dominion over them. And I finally did once I received the baptism of the Holy spirit, but it's the carnal uh, the, and that's in your, that's all in your soul. So what happens is when you are willfully continuing to do what God has either convicted you of in the spirit or your conscious has said, don't do this anymore, not for you anymore, you know, right. or stop this and you keep doing it, you are now in presumptuous sin. And what happens, though, is those people that push that down. I did that. This is what he was tell, showing me. My The whole point of me going to hell and the word presumptuous sin is the presumptuous sin that I was in at the time that I was taken to hell was I was, first of all, I was serving man through a religious spirit now. Okay. A man was building his kingdom and I was under a religious spirit thinking, well, I'm under leadership. So I'm building his, I'm building his uh, ivory tower on earth for him. I don't have my eyes on the father. I've mm. got my eyes on the man. Right. And, Which is like and, an idol. You weren't, you weren't, it, you weren't focused on Jesus. You were focused on man. That's right. And anytime you get your eyes off of God and he said, be followers of Christ. He did not say be followers of man. He said be followers of Christ. Now, if there are people out there that are serving God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you are under submission to their leadership, 
then yes. But even that is always checked, always checked. And I had gotten to the point where I wouldn't check it. I could see things as a seer. I could see all these things going on and I was being shown all these things. But what was my response? A religious spirit. Oh, okay. Well, you've brought me here in the beginning. And so you placed this into leadership. So I just need to pray more and me, 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 me. Now, Pat, had you maybe fasted, spent a sabbatical, got with the Lord and stepped away from men, don't you believe that the Holy Ghost would have shown you this revelation and you could have avoided all of this religious spirit? Absolutely. But it was gradual. Mm -hmm. The religious spirit is in the church and it's alive and, the well, and alive and well. And of course, our greatest example of the religious spirits are the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Okay, they were righteous on the outside. But here's the thing. It had gradually come in. And this is something about deception. Mm. Yeah. You can't be deceived against your will. Mm. The strongest thing that God gave us was our will. Um, he, uh, Satan can't cross your will. And neither can God. God, Satan can use your will and wear it down. And that's what he does to get people deceived and into sin. He will wear you down. Okay. On the other hand, because he always, he always counterfeits and what God does, because he, he can't, he doesn't have anything of his own. So he has to counterfeit God. So God, what he does is he's not going to cross your will. You are a free spirit. You are a free agent. I mean, we saw that with the fall in a perfect state. Satan fell from the sin of pride in a perfect state. And all those angels chose to go with him. And Adam and Eve, in a perfect state, Adam chose. He didn't, he, Adam wasn't deceived. Eve was deceived. Adam chose to rebel against God. That was a presumptuous sin. When Satan fell, it was a presumptuous sin. He chose to make that decision. God did not create robots. He created us with the ability to choose. And what did he say in his word? Choose life. The power of life and death are in the tongue. Choose life that you may live. I came to give life and life more abundantly. Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. Which one are you going to choose? So your whole life is based on choice, your will. Satan can't take you against your will unless you let him. Unless you let him. So when it comes to deception... When things start creeping in, and that's what he uses, he'll use religion to do it because some people are much more alert in the spirit and they know these things. And so they're, they know that there's certain things, no, can't do this, can't do that. So he just raises the bar. Satan just raises the bar on the deception, which is going on now. And so, the, and, you know, to trick you into getting into these places. So the first time that we ever encountered uh, it's called a sec, uh, it's called a sectarian spirit, sectarian spirit, and it divides the body of Christ and it elevates certain people above everybody else. Mm. And if you remember in the Bible, Julie, the fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, uh, pastors and teachers, the fivefold ministry is there for the building up and the edification of the saints. It was never to be elevated. It's the foundation of Christianity. It's to build up the saints, to help the saints, the body of Christ, build them up. It was never up here. And then we speak down to you. What happened during this time in our lives and how Satan used this was we have we've seen the good, the bad and the ugly. You know, we've been through the move of the, you know, the, the Pentecostal movement. We, well, we started out with the Jesus freaks, you know, when all of the hippies, we call them Jesus freaks, but they weren't freaks. But I mean, the Jesus movement, when all the hippies came in and became uh, Christians, which was a marvelous move of the spirit. And then the move of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then when the, the word of faith first started out, which, by the way, is very biblical, it got taken off into areas of error and now it's just uh, totally different but it's still the word of faith which we cut our teeth on and then you know over time if you live long enough i mean i'm in my 70s so if you live long enough you you see all of these different things take place well 
what happened was all of a sudden we had a new movement come through and um, it was the fivefold ministry. So you had all these self-proclaimed apostles and prophets and, and uh, it's, it's really funny to me that they focused on the apostles and the prophets, but you don't talk much. They don't talk much about pastors and teachers. It was elevated to the apostles and the prophets. And I noticed that, you know, what about all these pastors and teachers? And so what they would do is they came through and this, this message started going out and it became a sectarian spirit. It divided the church where it says, okay, well, I'm a prophet. And if you're going to speak into my life, then you better be a prophet or I'm a peer. Hmm. You're a sheep. And you have no authority to question me or speak into my life unless you're of my level. And that's exactly what they were saying. And it was called, we asked the Lord about it because in one, in the first church that we went in, that we were led to go to, um, was a well-known little church that was get, first getting started. And, and the man that was not a pastor, he was a hireling. And there's a huge difference of people that are in the pulpits today. There's so many hirelings in the pulpit. OK, he was never but he saw it as an opportunity to live a certain lifestyle. And it wasn't the church that I was in when I went to hell. But this man saw it as an opportunity to live a certain lifestyle and to have a church. And he just gathered people around him and he had the power of persuasion. He had that spirit of power of persuasion to manipulate people. And he was good at it. And he was, you know, he was uh, my age at the time. No, he was a little younger, but. And he was very good at what he did. And he would bring in other people and he'd bring in well-known people around him. And so they start, you know, you can get duped by that. Mm -hmm. So, but they asked us at that time, they asked my husband and I, they said, um, would you, we would like for, they approached us and said, would you please be, um, you know, home group leaders. We're going to start building home groups because now that was going on in the church. You know, all these cell groups, you know, Paul Youngy Cho, everybody got wind of Paul Youngy Cho and everybody's going to build their churches, build churches using all of these things. Home groups are wonderful, by the way. And I love home groups uh, because they're very personable. But so he came, they came to us. He didn't. He never spoke to us, but he sent someone else to speak to us, some other leader. And so this is how we first learned about it. Um, he, he came to us and it was on a Sunday and he said, hey, you know, he's asking for you to be a leader and, you know, a home group leader. And of course, I guess we were supposed to be flattered by it or whatever. But my husband, who is the man of God that he is, says, oh, well, OK, well, my wife and I will take that and we'll be praying about it and we'll let you know what God says about it. No, we didn't say that in a religious or disrespectful way. That was a way, you know, at that time, that, you know, that was a way of life for us. We prayed about everything. Mm -hmm. We tried to, but we were leading up to where we were stopping that even. You know what I'm saying? We were just being driven into this. And so we went home. My husband went in prayer and the Lord said, no. Mm -hmm. And so my, my husband asked him, why do you want, why do you not want us? Because our hearts have always been towards people. Mm -hmm. You know, that's always been in our heart. It's always about the one, isn't it, Julie? It's yes. about the one. It's about the and one. so it's not about this. It's about the one. Right. And so we've always been drawn to people. And me as a seer, I'm always seeing the ones that are on the outside, you know, and I'm always going for them. I'm always seeing the ones that nobody includes or nobody is paying attention to that. That's just how God uses me as a seer. And so anyway, uh, my, Gary asked him why. And he said, the Holy Spirit said to him, because they have a sectarian spirit and they are divided and they have elevated themselves through their pride above the people. And if you submit to that spirit, if you mm -hmm. submit and become house group leaders in your submission to that leadership, it will be a sin. You right. will be submitting to that spirit wow. and you see that will come upon you and it'll start coming in your family. Which is a curse, right? It's a, it's a demonic yes. curse. Yeah. It's division. 
Yeah. It's stri- it causes division in the body of the Christ. So mm-hmm. that right there, anytime there's elevation, there's pride. That was the first sin mm-hmm. is pride, the sin of pride. And so the people, so I, I, that's how we found out about it. Well, when we, when he, after, after about a, a while, it was quite some time when the Lord let us out of there and, and, and this other church was starting out uh, that was more of like precious faith. And the Lord put us into the very beginning of it uh, to help, you know, kind of pioneer it along. Um, it was clean. It was, it started out clean. Okay. It started mm-hmm. out right. You know, the, the man that was behind the pulpit was not a pastor, but he, he, uh, he was a teacher, but he wasn't a pastor and mm-hmm. people started telling him he was a prophet. It's amazing what people believe. You know, if you get enough people around you and they start telling you all these things and you just start believing it. But if you don't have, I call them the tools of trade, you mm-hmm. know, with apostles, it's signs and wonders. Evangelists, signs should be signs and wonders. With prophets, it's dreams and visions. But not everybody that has dreams and visions are a prophet. Th- those are vocations. Not everybody has a vocation. That's It doesn't work that way in the body of Christ. But it started out right, but it because he had been su- submitted okay. in that other church, it came through the door. And like you said, it's sneaky. The devil is sneaky. He's a he's yes. a master at trickery. So I think the key takeaway I'm hearing is we got to be hum- humbled. We have to stay in humility. Absolutely. We have to have Absolutely. reverential fear. We are Absolutely. lacking reverential fear. And to get out of the fear of man, and have That's the right. fear of the Lord. Yes. Yes. And can I, when you're talking about the fear of the Lord, this is crucial because this is what the Lord showed me. Let me, let me see my note here. Just a second. Okay. First of all, I want to talk, I want to say this about people that think that they are uh, born again and that they are still safe in that place. First of all, it says a certain sign that you don't have any spiritual life in you. And I'm reading this from my notes. If you have no desire towards Christ, Mm -hmm. if you do not delight in him, if the soul is not hungering and thirsting, then it does. It's not alive. You're not alive. See, you're just going through the motions. I was going through the motions. Oh my goodness. I had been serving for years. I'm telling you, you name it. We did it. Uh, our house was always an open door. We had anything that needed hospitality. It was our house gatherings for people. It was our house because we welcome people. It didn't matter who they were. And it wasn't just for leadership or anything like that. It was for whosoever was hungry. We opened up our house. Can and I so- ask you something real quick? That's maybe on a, on a personal, cause I think this might help people. If you are really honest with yourself in that time, were you operating in a religious spirit? Did you have the joy of the Lord? Were you filled with love and compassion and all the things that Jesus is? Were, were you at that time? Um, I, working up to that, I did. But what happened was, and I will share this with you, um, I got to the point to where, it, and it happened in this place that I was, it happened all right there, it started. Up until that time, I did have the joy of the Lord. Um, I was, I have to tell you this though, when you're, when you're in business and, uh, self-employment and we were for 28 years and I was helping my husband run his litigation support businesses and we had all these employees. So there's a field. Okay. You're always having to be sensitive to that, but you're busy. You're busy. busy. And then busyness is huge, huge in in leading to deception because you're so busy doing, doing, doing that you've replaced that intimacy. You re I did. I, I, I was so exhausted for crying out loud. You know, I'm helping my husband in his business. We're so involved in the church. And I look back now and I look at my, how things affected my children and how it was way too much. Why was it way too much? Because Julie, I didn't ask God. Mm -hmm. I just did what I thought was a mindset that I thought was expected of me because I was a believer 
And I thought that we're supposed to just serve and do whatever, you know, we're supposed to do. But I, I quit asking God at times, do you want me to do this? Because I had certain talents and abilities, people will impose upon you. They're building a church. They're building uh, their own thing there. And they, they need people. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's a known fact in the body that 20% do 80%. 20% do 80%. Mm -hmm. And so these 20% are exhausted. Right. Because they're trying to, and as soon as somebody comes into the church, instead of making disciples and discipling these new Christians, they say, oh, hey, can you volunteer and go in the nursery? Or can you do this and do that? And they need to be out there getting the word of God. See? Right. They, and, and, and yeah. Well, I was just going to add that, that this is, if you're not getting filled up, how can you give to somebody else? And then when you do give to somebody else, what is it coming out of? It's coming out of your that soul. spirit, your soul. Your, your right. soul. It's coming out of your soul. And in your soul, let me tell you something. You can do soul power is deadly. These Middle Eastern countries and these countries where they have all these witchcraft and all these things going on and they serve false gods, you would be amazed what they do in soul power. They can counterfeit. Well, look at Pharaoh. Look at the snakes. Okay, when Moses had his staff and it was a snake, look at what the magicians did with their snakes. They they counterfeited. Okay, right. and but we saw what happened. Soul power is deadly, and here's why: because mm -hmm. there's many people that have lost the anointing. They are no longer operating in the spirit, but they are relying only on their giftings out of the soul. And guess what happens? Familiar spirits, they it, are everywhere. So soul power, when you are giving out to someone and it's coming through your mind, your will, and your emotions, that's your soul, your mm -hmm. mind, your will, and your emotions. So if your emotions are you, that's why people live on a roller coaster all their life because they're driven by their emotions. They haven't brought them unto submission and to their spirit when they were either born again. And so what happens is they revert back to the soul. Well, I have this gift so I can do it. And that's presumptuous sin. That is very, I mean, that's. And then, and then the enemy comes in and it's that now turned into a stronghold. Yes, it has. And your conscience becomes seared. And that's what I wanted to tell you about the conscience, because the conscience is your, it's your moral compass. It distinguishes between what's morally good and what's morally bad. Okay. So if your conscience is part of your mind, and it makes your judgments in your behavior, it's going to either excuse you or it's going to accuse you, all right? In our soul, we can't rely on our conscience. You know, people say, oh, well, I just follow my heart. Oh, mm -hmm. no, 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 no. Your heart can deceive you, the Bible says. Right. Out of your heart comes the issues of life. You don't follow your heart. You follow the Holy Spirit. You follow the Spirit of God in your life. Because your heart can deceive you. And Satan knows that. Most people live their life through their soul. And that's why they're in bondage. Which is your feelings. And your we mind, know what the feelings your do. Your mind, your will, and your emotion. And the, right. Wayne Dyer made this. He, he, Wayne Dyer made this quote. The highest form of ignorance is when you reject something you don't know anything about. So people come in and they reject something, but they don't know anything about it. OK, you have to find out about it. The only thing that's going to renew your mind is the word of God. That's the only thing that's going to renew your mind, the word of God. And the mind is a battleground. And the only way that Satan can get to a person with evil or demonic influences is through the soul. Yes, that's the door. Mind, will and emotions. That's the only way he can gain entrance to a person. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, when he's gaining that entrance of these evil demonic influences that are in your life and operating. And, and there's, there's people in the Bible like Saul, King Saul. He didn't even know when the Holy Spirit left him. He didn't even know. And there's others that they lost the anointing. Look at Samson and to that very last thing that he did. Look at Solomon. The man that had all the wisdom in the world, and he says there's never going to be another one like him. 
He sinned in presumptuous sins because lust was his sin. He loved women. And so because of that, he fell away. He fell away from God. And he was the wisest of men. So to think that you can't be deceived is arrogant. It's pride. And, and people need to realize, and I, I'm sure that um, some, a lot of people do, but they need to be reminded that the, the first sin was pride. Okay. Any kind of elevation, mm -hmm. people thinking they're more spiritual than another pe person. That's not humility. That's right. Why do you think that you're more spiritual than someone else? That's not, that's elevation of your spirit. That's pride. Okay. Or, you know, exalting yourself because maybe you have a certain church or a platform and you've got 150 books out there that you've popped out like popcorn, you know, you know, which is going on all the time. But the thing is, is that pride was the first sin. Well, look at what Eve, it was the pride of life the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh that mm -hmm. caused her to fall, that caused mm -hmm. her to be deceived. What did Christ overcome in the wilderness? The three principalities, the pride of life, mm -hmm. the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh. Because why? Because that all comes under the spirit of mammon. People mm -hmm. think money, just money. No, money's only a part of it. Now, all those things, Self, what gratifies self comes over under all those princes, those three principalities. And that's what Yeshua overcame in the wilderness and what he defeated for us so that we don't have to give into it. And so when people and that is what does the Bible say about the mammon? It's the root, the love of it, the love of it is the root of all the evil. Well, why? The pride of life, the lust of the eye, and the lust of the flesh is behind all of it. Money is just a part of it. And money is, we've got the money changers in the church. When Jesus was there, they were outside, but now they're inside. There is. So, this, is so, mm -hmm. go ahead. this is just so many nuggets of wisdom that we need to get alone, do some self-inventory with the Holy Spirit, so that we can avoid these traps. Don't you mm -hmm. agree? Listen, it comes from the, it comes from the word. It, you mm -hmm. have to stay in the word. Mm -hmm. The word of God is the bread of life. Mm -hmm. Yeshua is the bread of life. And every single day we are to eat of his flesh. Right. What is, what is, we are to eat of his word. We yeah. are to it. We are to, we are to study. And these people, uh, you know, disciplines are important. I'm a very disciplined person, but I want you to know that there was a time I was just like everybody else. And this is part of a religious spirit. There's mm -hmm. so many facets of it. I'd get up, I'd have a little bit of time for the Lord. I'd have my scripture reference, you know, check my, yeah. little, my, yep, check, 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 my little devotional. Yeah. I'm good to go. And for the yeah. rest of the day, I'm doing my own thing. Mm. That's not what spending the time before the Lord is each morning. And you take that time. You start out and people say, well, I just don't have time to do that. I have such a life full of things. Well, you better make time mm. because that's your life. And pretty soon you keep like, you know, I got so busy, Julie. You know, mm. I'm raising, I'm raising my children, and they're all involved in all of their school activities and everything. And then I've got the business and I've got the church and I've got all these women's things that I'm involved in, you know, because everybody wants a part yeah. of you. you you're know? In, and it's, yeah. and so if you're not asking God, do I do this? Do you want me to do this? And just because I have the ability to do it doesn't right. mean I do it. Or I've you heard know, it said I, just because it's good doesn't mean it's God, you know, no. just do no, and good is the enemy of best. Yes. And so it gets and this religion comes on you. And then all of a sudden your conscience is seared. Mm. And what happens then, what happens is the Bible talks about a seared conscience. And it says, you know, what seems right to man, that scripture in Proverbs, there's a way that seems right to a man, but it ends in death. I, I, I have to tell you that I've been around it. I've experienced this myself. You will justify yourself. There's so many ways that people can, uh, presumptuous sins, examples of presumptuous sins. There's so many of them, Julie. And it just depends on 
who that person is individually. Remember, in God, when, when you were born, God gave you a DNA. You are the only person on this earth that has that DNA. You are the only person that has that fingerprint. You are uniquely created in his image once you have been conceived. Right. Okay, once the conception comes forth, you have your own identity. There is nobody on the face of the earth that's like you or can take your place. Right. You become what you believe. Your way of life, you become what you believe and what you allow. And the things that happen are what evolve in your life. And there are many people that have had terrible childhoods, terrible lives, and they were not in control of that. And sins mm -hmm. of the parents, generational mm -hmm. curses, um, ancestral curses came through. Everything that's evil is a demon spirit. It comes from Satan. It comes from hell. And that's why, just like you said, the generational curses, you know, I think of Joyce Meyer's testimony, how she was raised in a horrible upbringing, but she was able to turn her life around through the renewing of the mind. It goes back to yeah. the Bible. I say we take a challenge of getting the Bible in us, reading the Bible for as long as the, you, you get a change. You keep reading until you get a change. Get in yeah. the word. Yes. Yeah. And quit reading all these books about the Bible. Right. And other people's opinions about what they, the thing that disturbs me. And I, like I said, I'm a, I, I'm a voracious reader. I have a large library. Most of them, a lot of them are from like back in the Puritans and people like Spurgeon, you know, Tozer, Ed, Andrew Murray, you know, the ones that just, they were so dedicated to God. And they knew God intimately. They knew the Holy Spirit intimately. They knew Yeshua intimately. Those are the ones that I want to know how the Lord led them to teach me. Even now, I, I reread and reread. Yeah. But there are so many now, Julie, I they know. come right out of the soul. Someone yep. has some kind of an experience or somebody has a, a dream that's not even from God. And they go out there and they put it in a book. And now everybody, well, that's, yeah, yeah. that's between them and the Lord. And they're going to be accountable for that. But I agree, oh, like Smith Wigglesworth and some of these, oh. they, they spent hours in the word. They were truly transformed and you could see it and, and know by the spirit. And and Smith Wigglesworth never read any other book. Did you know that? Right. He, he only read the Bible when Polly, his wife, taught him how to read. Mm. He was illiterate until she taught mm. him. And when he learned to read, that's all he ever read. It's good enough. Everything you know. But I'm not saying don't read. I'm just saying yeah. be very discerning. I'm seeing so much error in what's yeah. evolved now. Stick yeah. with the ones that have been, uh, you know, their fruit has borne in their lives. Yeah. Not these ones that are out there giving all these new revelations and all this kind of stuff. But when you get back to presumptuous sins, Julie, I want people to know it's, it's individual. It's individual to them, their presumptuous sins. For instance, okay, I can say to you um, that, uh, for instance, I, for me, um, if I go back, you know, if I do something that the Lord has told me not to do anymore, I can't push that on you unless it's unless it's black and white. I mean, we know there's certain things we don't do and there's scriptures that God says he will lead sinners in the way and that he will cause people to see what is pure, what is impure, what is holy, what is not holy, what is good and what is not good. If you rely on him, what for you, for instance, when I started coming in uh, just to show you how the Holy Spirit works, here I was smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. I started when I was 13. It was just stupid ignorance. I thought it was a cool thing to do. Well, one day after I was born again, I'm sitting on the floor and I always pray pretty much, not always, but I shouldn't say always, but pretty much at that time, especially when I was, when I would talk to God and, and I would talk to him like I'm talking to you right now, I'd sit in a room and just talk to him and then I'd wait. You know, see if he had anything to say. And that's a whole nother thing that needs to be discussed. You know, one day is people don't wait on the Lord at all. Mm -hmm. They don't spend time waiting on. They spend too much time doing this. 
but, and I did that in the beginning because I was a child in Christ and immature and I was so zealous, you know? And so I was sitting there and while I was talking to him, I'm just token away on my cigarette, just token away. And all of a sudden it dawned on me. Well, it was the Holy spirit. I wasn't baptized in the Holy spirit yet, but all of a sudden the Holy spirit inside of me, let me know. And I sat, I sat there and I looked at it and I thought, wow, if I'm going to be talking to people about Jesus, why would I be smoking and doing something that is not good for my body? And if he, if my body is his now and he bought it and he, I am the temple, what kind of a witness would this be? I knew nothing at that time. The Holy Spirit put that in me supernaturally. And immediately I said to him, okay, Father, you know I love these. I love these cigarettes. And I'm a two-packer a day, and I am very addicted to them. Mm -hmm. First thing in the morning, last thing at night. But I renounce this, and I give it to you. And if you will help me, please, will you deliver me from this? I prayed that on a Friday. And just to tell you what he did for me, and of course, I'm a baby Christian, and, and, not, and but uh, it doesn't matter. He still answers prayer. On Friday, I prayed that prayer. I did not have a cigarette the whole weekend and never knew it. Wow. That's a the strong whole, habit, too. Yeah. And I did not know it until all of a sudden I was driving into work on Monday and in the car. Uh, no, I didn't have one in the car either. It, you know, I was having to drive a long ways into work. And all of a sudden I got into work. I sat down at my desk. There was a pack of cigarettes there. I pulled one out. I had it. I lit it. I thought I was going to choke to death. Mm -hmm. It was the most disgusting, horrific, horrible taste. And I threw, you know, I just, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this is terrible. And then all of a sudden he brought back to my memory, my prayer. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you sit there stealth and you think, oh, what just happened? And then he took me back over the weekend supernaturally. He showed it to me. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, well, in my infancy and God, I think gets, uh, you know, amused by this. It's my lunch hour. And I thought, I want to see if this really works. I want to see if this is true. I picked up another one, same exact thing. Wow. I threw him away. Never smoked since. Wow. That, was what a 70, story. That, was, that was in 76. So mm -hmm. I'm here to tell you that for me, I had to get, you know, delivered of that. Now, if I had kept going to that or kept doing that, mm -hmm. then I would have been in presumptuous sin, you see, because he was convicting me of it. Okay. For some, it could be foul language. Yeah. For others, it can be gluttony. It can be food. Yeah. It, there's so many different places in your life that God has convicted you about, you know, and for others. Go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, you, those are great examples, but there's times when people, many of us, probably all of us, we do go back, we willfully sin, but mm -hmm. we do, we, I don't want people to be discouraged by that. We can get back up. We can get yes, right. Yes, we can. We yes, can. we can. It comes through acknowledging your sin, acknowledging it, own it. Mm -hmm. I have sinned, Father. I have sinned against you. I have willfully defied what you have asked me not to do. Whatever it is, I've willfully defied that. Forgive me. I repent of this sin, and you own it. You tell him. He already knows what it is, but it's all in the motive of the heart. Your ears need to hear it and own up to it, and that should produce godly sorrow in you. That should produce godly sorrow. You should right. be... Not just because you got caught right. or not just because you made another mistake, but because you are willfully sinning against a holy God. And doesn't that go back to if you have a, a strong relationship, uh, you know, you you and the Lord have a relationship going on. You're falling more in love with him. You, you're getting the word in you. Then that sorrow is going to increase. The conviction is going to increase. And you're going to go, you know what? I'm not going to willfully sin anymore for the most part, That's you know? Right. But then you have to add, once you confess, okay, once you confess your sin mm -hmm. and you ask and you repent of it, I am so sorry. 
forgive me. I, I, it, you know, this, this is dishonor to you. You know, this brings reproach on your name because if you're doing something in public that is casting a shadow on him that you're not supposed to be doing or you're misrepresenting him, think of Moses. When Moses hit that rock the second time, he was misrepresenting God. What did it cost him? He never could enter the promised land. He got to see it. He got to see it. And God loved him so much. God buried Moses and even Satan doesn't know where he is. But it cost him because he knew better. He did it out of his arrogance. He did it out of his anger. He knew better. And he was in a high place of responsibility. People say, well, that wasn't fair of God to do that to Moses. Well, you can take it up with him. But the point is, it doesn't matter. It, what the point is, is yes, Julie, yes. Once you recognize that you have sinned and willfully sinned, then you go right back to God. Then you ask the Holy Spirit to give you the power each time because God says that he will never, 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 never lead us into temptation. Okay, it's the lust that brings us into temptation, but he will always deliver us from evil and he will always, if we ask, he will always give us a way of escape. Mm -hmm. So when he gives that way of escape and you ask him, say, look, I, can, I did this. When I first became born again, it was between that time that I became baptized in the Holy Spirit. I was still so carnal. I still had so many things in me that I was having a hard time overcoming, you know? And so I would ask him, I need power. I need you, Holy Spirit. I want to, I desire not to do this anymore. But here's the problem, Julie, is that if you keep letting this evolve and evolve and evolve and you don't deal with it, pretty soon there's no conviction anymore. Right. Pretty soon there's no desire to repent. Pretty right. soon it's now a way of life and that becomes your normal and your reality. And doesn't that go back to, uh, what is the scripture, Matthew 20 through, 24, 13, where it says, he that endures to the end will be saved. So is, yes. are you referring now to where your conscience is getting seared and yes. reprobate? Yes. Yes, I am. Because I wanted to, I wanted to address that. Um, I have it down here also. And uh, I want to, I just want to say one thing about this, the spirit of mammon when we talk about well, you can, you know, we know the story of the, the rich young ruler, if you want to apply it to that, because there's a lot of that going on in the body of Christ now. And it's uh, it's deadly is the deceitfulness of riches. And what the deceitfulness of riches is, is those that have become accustomed to their to blessings. OK, they become they become accustomed to their blessings. It is now because it come a standard of living. And it's a way of life for them. And, and it, for many, it's become a very opulent lifestyle. And the greatest one, I believe, personally, uh, because the, the Lord says in the word that it is mammon, which encompasses money. It's not always money. It's whatever that lust, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life is in your life. But if it is money... And it, what happens is it's, it's an addiction, it becomes an addiction and the power that it brings. Because here's something that people don't understand about lust. You think about lust and a lot of people want to think, oh, well, but lust is sexual. No, it is not. Lust is never gratified. It's never enough. Do you know the Bible says that hell increases itself every day? That it opens wide its mouth? There's a scripture. There's, I've got all kinds of scriptures about hell. And that one of the things hell does is it opens its mouth wide every day to enlarge itself. Lust is never gratified. Evil is never gratified. They're constantly raising the bar. So anything that you are doing or anything that is controlling you or that you have set your standard of living on, it's never going to be gratified. It's never. And so therefore, when you go to hell, that's the thing that's going to torment you because it's never going to be gratified there, but it's going to be the very torment that is used against you. Mm -hmm. So the deceitfulness of riches, which is happening, you know, with a lot of people in the church and out of the church, is it's the love of it. It's the pleasure it brings. It's the power, the notoriety, the esteem for mm -hmm. self building an empire on the earth. That, but um, many years ago, um, 
when I was praying at the first of the year, typically what my husband and I do on uh, New Year's Eve is we take communion. And the reason we do this is we want to, and we may not do it at midnight because we may not be up, but New Year's Eve, we will take communion together. And that is our tithe for the new year. And so we dedicate the whole new year to the Lord. And then we, after that, we take time uh, in the next couple of weeks to seek him about what are your priorities for us this year? What do you want to focus on specifically? I mean, we're, my husband and I, our whole vision has been changed to the lost. The lost first and then the body, praying for the body of Christ because we want Jesus to come back. And we want him to come back quickly. And he is needs to clean up his bride. We are betrothed to him. And we need to have the right garments on. And so uh, we're praying for the body of Christ and what because of what is entered into the body of Christ. So we were praying. And this particular year, um, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said that my people are duped. He used the word duped. You know, they're being tricked. OK, they've been uh, it's kind of like who has bewitched you, you know, uh, the Galatians. He said, who has bewitched you? They've been duped. And he said to me, this was a number of years ago. He said, I am going to bring down those ivory towers that have been built in my name. Because man has built his kingdom. We, on the other hand, were created to worship God. You know, it's like the whole earth was supposed to be a worship center, worship God. That was the way it was in the beginning. And then we are to go and we are to proclaim the good news and we are to make disciples. And and the Bible says a man that wins sows is wise. We can't save a person, but we can with our whole manner of living, which is our that the word conversation means whole manner of living with our whole manner of living that others might observe us and desire would provoke them to jealousy. They desire what we have. Well, what has happened was that because the people, he instructed us to bring his kingdom down on earth as it is in heaven. That's the Lord's prayer, isn't it? And so every day my husband and I pray, you know, Father, we desire to bring your kingdom down on earth as it is in heaven. This day, we have the faith for this day. We're only required to believe for this day. And so we're exercising our faith. So today we're bringing your kingdom. Never in the word did it say, say that man is to build his kingdom on earth. Never. It is all about the Lord's kingdom coming down on earth as it is in heaven. And so we are the kingdom of heaven on earth suffers violence, the Bible says. And the violent, those who have their whole armor of God on, who worship God, who are part of the kingdom of, of heaven on earth, we take it by force until he comes. And the whole point is the transformation of a human being. That's the whole point. That's why he came was that he could transform the lives of human beings. Never was it to build kingdoms or all these major ministries or all these kind of things. It wasn't for that. It was to build, it was to, for the transformation of lives. And so that is what we're supposed to be focused on. And it's not about, you know, uh, all these other things that are in the body of Christ. It's not about people feeling good. Nowhere in the Bible did it said, did Jesus say, I want you to feel good about yourself. <laughs> Never. He said, I came to bring a sword. That's I did right. not come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. And that means division. And so anyone that has that, and this is how a religious spirit can, can come in and sear someone's conscience because, you know, they start out right thinking, well, you know, the Lord has blessed me and, and he is, you know, people are uh, coming or whatever, or I have this platform or I have, you know, this ministry or whatever. And they think that that is they're reproducing. But I'm here to tell you, I'm here to tell you right now, Julie, there's not being a lot of reproducing in the body of Christ. There's a lot of movement going from church to church to hear message for message and a lot, a lot of knowledge being put out there. 
but there's a form of godliness, but it's, there's no power. And, and, and I can only speak for this nation because I live here, but, and I'm not saying every place is like that. I'm sure there are places where people are seeking God and they truly are uh, searching for him. And there truly is things going forth of the spirit, but the majority, you don't see major uh, convert, I mean, uh, major transformations. And, and that's, and, and people don't understand, you know, a conversion, like, okay, a conversion is when you know, all of a sudden it's revealed to you, okay, that I know that this is not good, this is not good, this is bad. That's a conversion, okay? Mm -hmm. But that's not regeneration. You have a knowledge, but now you have to go a step further. And you say, okay, I have the knowledge that I need, I need Yeshua, I need Jesus, I am so fed up with my life. I am so fed up with what I think, you know, uh, the, my choices in my life. I need Jesus. And then you go into where when you are born again, you have regeneration. See, conversion is just knowing right from wrong. And a lot of people walk around and they think because all of a sudden, yeah, I'm not going to do this anymore because it's not right to do. But does Jesus abide in you? Does Jesus even know you? I mean, when he stand, when he gives us that example, I mean, what is the worst word you could possibly hear? For me, is if I came up and knocked on the door, like at the marriage feast, and he says, hello, friend, who are you? I'm paraphrasing. And I say, well, I'm Pat. Well, you're not in the right kind of garments to come in here. But wait a minute, wait a minute. I served in the church, you know, I had house groups. I mean, I went worldwide, you know, I flew my plane to all these countries and I, and all these, I put out all these books and everything for you. And I did all these things for you, mm-hmm. Sunday school, everything. And, and I laid hands on the sick and all this kind of stuff. And he says, depart from me. I never knew you because why? You know what another presumptuous sin is? Taking the Lord's name in vain. And what is your first thought, Julie, when you hear that? Saying, oh, my God, or using his name in vain as a cuss word. Profanity. Mm -hmm. Do you know what taking the Lord's name? And it's in the Ten Commandments. Do you know why? Anytime you profess to be a Christian and you're not living it, you're taking the Lord's name in vain because you're a hypocrite. Anytime you evoke his name and you're not living for Christ, you're not obeying him, you're taking his name in vain. Anytime you put his name on something that came right out of you, out of your your soul, and you're saying, oh, God told me this, God told me that, or God did this, you're taking the Lord's name in vain. You're a hypocrite. You're casting a shadow. When you're living a certain way and you tell people, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. You're taking his name in vain because you just cast a shadow on him. That's taking the Lord's name in vain because you're claiming to be something that you're not. You're claiming something that he's not doing in you. That's very simple. Yeah, it's very simple. It's very simple. And that's why he said, don't take the Lord's name in vain. We, you know, our minds are so small and the way of thinking is so small. And we just say, oh, well, that just means, oh, I got to quit cussing. Well, you should anyway, if you're a Christian. I mean, why is that still there? You know, but because that's an influence, that's a demon influence in the soul. That's Mm -hmm. an unclean spirit. Mm -hmm. So you've got to get rid of it. How am I going to get rid of it? Well, I got to confess it. And then I've got to ask the Lord to help me. And then I've got to stand against it. Mm. Resist mm. Satan and he will flee from you. Mm. You have a will. Resist him in these areas of presumptuous sins. Resist it. The thing that, the thing that I get concerned about the most is people that have evolved to where now they no longer have conviction. And see, mm. this was the whole point with me. It wasn't where I was then. It was where I was going to be led to had I continued where I was. You see, and I think that, 
Yes. And I think that's a great place to land with your story because through your hell experience, that is where you would have landed had you kept that same progression. Yes. It was the end result. And do you know what the end result is of presumptuous sins? If you don't, if you don't take care of them, if, if you don't bring them back to the Lord, it's apostasy. And if you get to apostasy, there's no return. Prodigals? No, there's a return. There's a return for prodigals. But when you come to that place of apostasy, and then you, there is no return for you. Mm-hmm. And, and so this thing about, well, I'm good to go and I can't fall away. The, there's scripture after scripture, and you brought it up a minute ago when you said that um, if, if you endure to the end, that is so important. That is so important for people to know that the Bible says, for, for instance, here it is in Timothy. I mean, how can it be more clear in the Bible? It is so simple. It is not difficult to understand. Even a child can understand it. All you have to do is ask the Holy Spirit when you open up the Bible, ask the Holy Spirit at that moment, Holy Spirit, I'm asking you right now, I'm opening up the Word of God, and I want you to add, uh, show me what, you, what you're saying in the Word of God. I want you to make it real to me. I want you to speak to me. I want you to brand it on my heart. Open up the word to me. Ask. That's all you have to do is ask. Because he says in 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. Giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Right. Speaking lies. Yeah. That's right. Speaking lies and hypocrisy having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, let me tell you, let me ask you, these people out there that have, to, to me, it's one of the greatest deceptions that the enemy has used is this doctrine that once saved, you're good to go. Because if there's going to be a great falling away, which we know in the Bible that there is going to be, how do you fall away from something you never had? There's your answer. And there's many answers. Those that said, he says here, that if you will do not hearten your hearts as in rebellion, if you endure to the end, he who endures to the end will be saved. Endures to the end. What that message has done, it has caused irresponsibility in the body of Christ because people think it's the get out of hell card free and they have no responsibility. All they have to do is say those magic words I'm good to go. My name's written in the last book of life. And so if I confess my sins along the way, I'm good. That's presumptuous sin in itself, thinking that way. That's Mm -hmm. presumption. You're presuming upon the grace of God Mm -hmm. just with that thought alone. So he said in the word, he said in Revelation, here's the final book, 22, 18 and 19. He said this. If anyone adds to these things in the book, and there's a lot of people out there that are adding to the word of God. They're saying things, they're, they're talking about things it doesn't say. And then there's a lot of people out there, it says, or if anyone takes away from the words of the book, okay? They're taking away from the word of God. They're saying like, well, healing's not for today. This is not for today and all this kind of things, you know, because that's what different denominations do, isn't it? They separate people. We believe in this, but we don't believe in that, you know, and it separates people. So what does he says? If you do that, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city and from the things which are written in his book. Hmm. I was separated from the holy spirit, uh, from the holy city forever, forever. But yet I would be looking at it. That was part of my torment because that chasm in my life that was started out like this. And this is what happens. We go along the way. We start going like this. We're zealous for the Lord. We're hungry. We desire. We're doing these wonderful things. We've set up our disciplines and we must. And we keep going and we keep going. And then also we have a little compromise and we start doing this and we keep going. And pretty soon it's this. Right. It's good. It's that. Yeah, exactly right. 
And going back to, I always say, but that's where the trap of the lukewarm comes in. And that's why he yeah. desires us to not go to that yeah. place because that's, that's where right. we need. Well, Pat, I, I just want to say uh, you are a powerhouse for the Holy Spirit. And I just appreciate all your nuggets of wisdom. I appreciate your testimony and what your experience and what that showed you and showed us. And I just thank you so much for being with us today. And you, if people want to reach out to you, if you know, maybe they have questions or they just want to ask you something uh, about anything. You, you said you'd make that available through an email, right? That we can. Leave. Yes, I do. I set up a separate email if people want to contact me. Um, and it is um, sentenced to hell 91 at AOL.com. It's all in lowercase. That is sentenced to hell 91 at AOL.com. Okay. And we'll leave that in the description. And again, thank you so much, Pat, for being with me. It was truly an honor to have you today. Well, can I can I finish off with prayer? I was just gonna you read my mind. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> also, there is that photo that I would like for you to show for a minute. And then I would just like to say something about the photo before I Okay, yeah. Why don't you go ahead? Okay, there's a photo that I saw just uh years ago in a bulletin. And when I saw this photo, I don't know who made it or whatever of this sculpture. As soon as I saw it, the, the thing that came to me was the whole W-H-O-L-E of man. And when I saw it, it was like, that's it. That is who, what man is who does not have Jesus, Yeshua, as his Savior and Lord and cannot get to the Father because the only way to the Father, God, is through Yeshua. And this is the whole of man without God and this huge void. And it's also the whole of man of people that commit presumptuous sins and they keep going and going to where this void in them keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger to where there's nothing inside. And guess what? He can fill that void. You, he, he creates the need so that he can fill the need. So when you give way to anything in your life that has caused you to have that void, and it's your choice, it's your choice, it's your choice to go to hell. It's your choice to go to heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit working in you and convicting you to where you receive the gift of salvation. You can only get to Jesus by through the Holy Spirit, and you can only get to the Father through Jesus. That is the only way. If you want that void in your life filled, that is the solution. So I'm here to tell you that's how you do it. So um, do you want me to pray now? Amen. So. Let's go ahead and pray. Thank you. Okay. Father, I want to thank you for who you are. Oh, God, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for who you are. I am so grateful that you are sovereign, that you are holy. I am so grateful that you are the same yesterday and today and forever. And I am most grateful, Father, that you are not a respecter of persons. You're not a respecter of persons. I am so grateful that you loved us so much that you sent your son that whosoever, whosoever, doesn't matter who they are, doesn't matter what they've done, it doesn't, none of that matters. That whosoever calls upon your name, whosoever calls out for you, whether it's in despair, whether it's in hopelessness, yeah. whatever it is in their lives, Father, when they call out to you in godly sorrow and remorse, you said, I will hear them. I will hear them. And I am so grateful for that. I am so grateful personally that you spared me hell that you were merciful to me. I am so grateful, Father, that you put the spirit of the fear of the Lord in me. That's one of the seven spirits of God that surrounds your throne. And you put that in me. And every single day, Father, you know that I continue to ask for that every single day because I know 
that that is the only thing in this horrible, wicked, cursed world that's going to keep me as the apple of your eye. It's going to mm. keep me in the eye of the storm. It's the mm. only thing that's going to keep me protected and, and, and out of reach of my enemy, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And so yeah. right now, Father, I yeah. am asking that the Holy Spirit go to each and every person yes. that is listening, that has yeah. heard this. I am praying, Holy Spirit. I am using the very faith that you have given me. And I am asking for extravagant faith. Yeah. I am asking for every single person that hears this message, that their names will be written in the Lamb's book of life and that they will not leave the earth until it's done. I am asking this. I am taking the faith that yes. you've given me, and I'm using it for your kingdom come down on earth and transform the lives of these ones. There's so many out there, Father, that are lost. There's so many in the body of Christ that are deceived. Father, I am asking you for every single one. I'm doing this for your son. I'm doing this for you, Yeshua, so that they, they will come satisfaction to the, your soul because you died for every single one of them and you deserve every single one of them. I'm asking for heaven to be increased today. Yes. I'm asking for the enlargement. I am asking mm -hmm. for your mercy of yes. those, Father, that Holy Spirit, that you vex them. I don't care what you have to do to them to bring them to the end of themselves yes. because eternity is forever. And it doesn't matter this earth. It's what happens in eternity where they go. And if you have to vex them, if you whatever you have to do that's radical to bring the one to the end of themselves to where they cry out to you, you will hear them. Thank you. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to cause their will to be conformed to the will of God. I'm asking that they will see the need of a Savior. They will, see, Or if they are in presumptuous sin, they will see the need for forgiveness. They will see the need in their life that they don't want this anymore. Father, yes. I thank you. And I'm also asking that the spirit of the fear of the Lord come upon everyone who is listening to this, Father. I don't care how seared their consciences are. That yeah. sword of the Spirit, That's it right. is powerful. And it divides the soul and the spirit. And you are capable. You are capable. Our faith, our hope, everything rests upon you and the finished work of the cross and your resurrection power, Yeshua. We rest everything on that. And right now I'm asking that the sword of the spirit be thrust into these ones, dividing the, the soul from the spirit so they will no longer be prisoners of their souls, that mm -hmm. they will be released and loose from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom yes. of life. And That's right the gift of life. And I want to thank you for this now. I want to thank you yes. for allowing me to speak this, Father. I want to thank you for the anointed prayers, fervent, effectual prayers. This is what it's about. It's about the one, but I'm asking for ones, thousands of them, Father. That's what we can do with our extravagant faith for your kingdom. Mm -hmm. Your kingdom coming down today. Your will transforming the life of the one by the thousands, Father. That's what I'm asking for. I'm using your faith that you have given me. It all came from you, and I'm exercising it according to your word. And I am using it for your kingdom and your kingdom alone. And so I thank you today. I thank you, Lord, for each and every person. I release, Father, the peace that surpasses all understanding. I'm asking for the Prince of Peace to come across these ones, Father. And I'm asking them to just guide the Prince of Peace. I'm asking you, guide these people. Lead them in the everlasting way. Convict them for righteousness sake. We don't want one lost. Your perfect will is not one will be lost. We know in your permissive will that many multitudes are being lost, but we're going to use our faith together. And I thank you, Father. I thank you that you go through the body of Christ. I thank you that the spirit of the fear of the Lord comes through the body of Christ, Father. I thank you that it will be filled with godly sorrow that leads mm -hmm. to repentance and confession, Father. I thank you. And most importantly, I thank you that as the Ancient of Days, as the king of old, that you drop down from heaven and you work your salvation on the earth 
I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit, your advocate on this earth who is doing this. And I thank you for the work that you're doing in each and every single person that is listening to this message and any other of these messages that come across touching the afterlife. I thank you for it, Father. I bless you, God the Father. I bless you, God the Son. And I bless you, Holy Spirit. And I am so grateful that you are in my life. So grateful. So grateful that you keep me in the hollow of your hand. So Amen. grateful. In the name of Yeshua, I pray. Amen. Yeshua's name. Amen.